Thanks for taking the time to watch this video today. Today we're covering the frontal plane. So we've done a video on the sagittal plane, we've done a video on the transverse plane, and today we're going to cover the frontal plane. And this is something that I've been wanting to do for a while, because if you're a subscriber to the blog or you read the blog, you probably notice that at least once every post, I mention the plane or the plane's emotion. And that's really important for you to understand on some level so that you can really get a deeper understanding of that content. Um, so I'm hoping that you can go back and you can see these videos and you can, help, you can hopefully understand the uh, motion or motions at that joint or joints. I've also wanted to do this for a while because I wanted my students to have something that they could continue to go back to as many times as they need to to really own this information because this information is really really important when we think about human function so what I mean by that is immediately you should be able to see the joint you should be able to see the plane and you should be able to see the axis and if you can see those things you no longer have to memorize muscles okay you no longer have to memorize muscles and that's a huge huge problem it doesn't matter what field we're talking about, that most people don't know their muscles or don't own the muscles. And so what I mean by that is, let's think of a muscle, let's say, flexor carpi radialis, okay? So right away you should think it's a muscle in the form, okay? So let's think about this, flexor carpi radialis. What can we extrapolate from the name? Okay, that muscle, right away you should think, is in the form, okay? So we're saying flexion in the name, and then of course because we're saying carpi, we're saying that that muscle is crossing the wrist joint and it's attaching to the hand. So you don't even really know, need to know the exact attachments, okay? But right away you know that muscle does flexion and it's gonna do flexion of the hand at the wrist joint because you know carpi means hand. So the muscle is crossing the wrist joint and it's attaching to the hand. So if you look at the axis, you can see that the axis is running from medial lateral, or medial to lateral, so we would call it a medial lateral axis. The axis is at the wrist joint, and we're saying the muscle is flexor carpi radialis. So that muscle, in the form, is crossing the uh, wrist, okay, it's attaching to the hand, and it's anterior, okay, because it's on the front side here, it's anterior to that medial lateral axis. So that says that that muscle, because it's anterior to that medial lateral axis, is gonna do flexion of the hand at the wrist joint. Now, because it says radialis in the name, again, flexor carpi radialis, that's saying if you know that the radius is lateral in anatomical position, the radius is lateral in anatomical position, if you know that, now you've determined what that muscle will do in the frontal plane. So what I mean by that is we know the muscle's crossing the wrist joint and we know what the joint will do. It will allow for two planes of motion. So the wrist joint is a biaxial joint. So it's allowing for motion in the sagittal plane. And of course, it's allowing for motion in the frontal plane. So now I can place an axis at the wrist joint that's going in this direction, okay? And because that muscle is lateral to this axis, it's outside of this axis, because it's on the radial side of the form, then it will shorten or concentrically contract, and it will do radial deviation or abduction of the hand at the wrist joint. So again, that muscle is outside of this axis or lateral to this axis and the muscle will shorten or concentrically contract to do abduction or radial deviation of the hand at the wrist joint. So again, you no longer have to memorize the muscle or the attachments of the muscle, it helps but right away you can determine what that muscle is going to do. So we can extrapolate some information from the name of the muscle, we can immediately see the axis, we can immediately see the plane, and we can figure out a lot of information. So that's why this is so important. 
So thinking about the frontal plane, you can see that, again, going to the clock, you can see that the clock is lying in the frontal plane. And of course, I can take the axis and I can place the axis in line with the axis of the clock here. And the axis is running from anterior to posterior. So we would call this an anterior posterior axis. So we combine those terms, anterior posterior, and we would call this an anterior posterior axis. So that you can see the axis is perpendicular to the plane, so we would call this the frontal plane. And another way to describe this axis is we could describe this axis as a sagittal horizontal axis. So what does that mean? Well, if you think back to what we talked about in the sagittal plane, you can see that the clock is cutting the body or my body into right and left halves, and we call that the sagittal plane and you can see the axis now is lying in the sagittal plane. So another way to describe this axis would be a sagittal horizontal axis because the axis is lying in the sagittal plane and of course it is horizontal or parallel to the floor. So we can describe this as a medial lateral axis or we could describe it as a sagittal horizontal axis. Either way the axis is perpendicular to the plane. So if you can see the axis, you can see the plane, okay? So we know that the frontal plane is going to cut the body into front and back halves. And then, of course, we said the sagittal plane is going to cut the body into right and left halves. And then if we take the same plane and place it here, you can see that the plane is going to cut the body into upper and lower halves, and of course we call that the transverse plane. Okay, so since we're talking about the frontal plane, we're talking about a plane that is cutting the body into front and back halves. So the first thing we're going to look at is abduction of the arm at the shoulder joint. So we talked about the head of the humerus, okay, being like a golf ball and it's a convex surface and it's going to meet the concave surface of the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity. So you can see that this is a very shallow surface and the head of the humerus, okay, it's like a golf ball because it's like a convex surface there, is meeting the concave surface, the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity depending on how you learned it. And you can see that's a very shallow surface so it's like the golf ball sitting on the golf tee. So this by definition is a ball and socket joint. So it's going to allow for three planes of motion. So we would call it a triaxial joint. So it's triplanar. It's allowing for three planes of motion. And we can place the axis at the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint. And you can see, again, anatomical position that my arm or humerus is moving away from midline. So we would call that abduction of the arm at the shoulder joint. And then, of course, if I bring the arm closer to the body or closer to the midline, so I'm adding to the midline, we would call that abduction of the arm at the shoulder joint. Of course, I could cross midline as well. So again, abduction of the arm at the shoulder joint, adduction of the arm at the shoulder joint. Another example of motion in the frontal plane is actually the scapula and you probably sense this if any time that you've ever been stressed you you probably felt your shoulder creeping closer to the back of your head or your ear and so uh, elevation of the scapula would look like this you can see that the scapula is coming closer to my occipital ridge or my superior nuchal line or even the ear, okay? And we would call this elevation of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint. And of course, the opposite of that would be depression of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint. So again, elevation of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint and of course, depression of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint. So that motion of the scapula is occurring in the frontal plane. At the same time that you're seeing the scapula elevate, 
you're also, if you feel it, you can feel the clavicle elevating. So if we follow the clavicle all the way over to the manubrium, we'll feel where that clavicle meets the manubrium. So we call that the FC joint or the sternoclavicular joint. And you can feel as you elevate the scapula at the scapulocostal joint or scapulothoracic joint, you can also feel that clavicle moving. So at the same time that the scapula is elevating, the clavicle is also elevating. Of course, both the clavicle and the scapula are moving in the frontal plane. And that's really important to understand when we look at overall shoulder function and practical application. So I don't think I've ever seen anybody talk about the function of the clavicle as it relates to the overall function of the shoulder, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. But if you think about it, this is not a joint either. Okay, so this scapula uh, lying on the ribs, we call it the scapulocostal joint or the scapulothoracic joint. But really, if you think about it, it's really not a pure joint. It's really not a joint at all, actually. But if you think about the clavicle, okay, the clavicle is moving, and of course, the scapula is going to move along with it. If you were to break the clavicle, you would no longer be able to move your arm. So that clavicle is extremely important because it's attaching, it's attaching the upper extremity, the scapula, the humerus, the forearm, the hands, okay, to the axial skeleton. And we know that because we can follow the clavicle all the way over and the clavicle, of course, meets the manubrium or the sternum. And so that's connecting the upper extremity to the axial skeleton. So if you're not familiar with the upper extremity, it would be the scapula, the clavicle, the humerus or arm, and the forearm, and then of course the hand. So that clavicle is attaching the upper extremity to the axial skeleton, and of course the muscles uh, are also playing a huge role there as well. Um, then we can look at the hip joint, and you can see that we have an axis going in this direction. So again, we would say the axis is running from anterior to posterior. So again, we would combine those terms and say it's an anterior posterior axis or a sagittal horizontal axis now at the hip joint. So if you think about it, you can see that the femur or thigh is moving closer to the midline and we would call that adduction of the femur or thigh at the hip joint. And then of course the opposite of that would be abduction of the femur at the hip joint. So adduction of the femur at the hip joint and abduction of the femur at the hip joint. I'll say it one more time. Adduction of the femur at the hip joint, abduction of the femur at the hip joint. So again, abduction, you're adding to the midline and abduction you're taking away so you can see that that femur thigh is moving away from the midline okay so those motions are occurring in the frontal plane as well and of course that's when the foot is off the ground now if, imagine that the foot is fixed okay and I'm gonna place the axis at the same joint so it's running from anterior to posterior and now imagine the femur is fixed and you can see the pelvis moving closer to the femur, okay? So the pelvis is moving closer to the femur of the thigh, and we would call that adduction of the pelvis at the hip joint. So again, it's adduction of the pelvis at the hip joint, and of course the opposite of that is abduction of the pelvis at the hip joint. You can see that we can continue on that same path and it would still be called abduction of the pelvis at the hip joint. So again, abduction of the pelvis at the hip joint and abduction of the pelvis at the hip joint. Okay? Something to think about when we think about the frontal plane, again, just to reinforce, the axis is always perpendicular to the plane and like we talked about with the sagittal plane, flexion extension primarily occurs in the sagittal plane, and abduction and adduction primarily occurs in the frontal plane. So abduction, adduction, 
primarily occurs in the frontal plane. So if you watch the video on the sagittal plane, you probably, probably already guessed that when we look at the thumb or motion of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint, what we're seeing is abduction and adduction of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint is actually occurring in the sagittal plane. So that's the only exception. Abduction, adduction primarily occur in the frontal plane, but that will change when we look at the thumb or motion of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint. So abduction and adduction of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint is occurring around a medial lateral axis or an axis that's oriented more towards being medial lateral and of course if it's oriented more towards being medial lateral then it would be perpendicular to the sagittal plane. So the axis always determines the plane. So in this example, this is a great example, abduction and adduction of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint is occurring in the sagittal plane because it's a medial lateral axis. So that axis is oriented more towards being medial lateral. It's perpendicular to the sagittal plane. So therefore, abduction, adduction of the thumb at the first carpal metacarpal joint is occurring in the sagittal plane. Okay, I hope this helps. Thanks a lot.